was a dreary night of November that I beheld the accomplishment of my toils. With an anxiety that almost amounted to agony, I collected the instruments of life around me, that I might infuse a spark of being into the lifeless thing that lay at my feet. On New Year's Day, 1818, the novel Frankenstein or the Modern Prometheus was first published. Most of the reviews were hostile and it didn't sell at all well. And yet, within a few years, this story of a young scientist who makes a creature, a new Adam, out of second-hand body parts, gives it life, then regrets what he's done, only to be haunted by his hideous progeny. This story had entered the bloodstream of popular culture, and the Frankenstein word, the F word, had already become shorthand for all sorts of public anxieties about progress. Countless adaptations later, 120 films alone at the last count, on small and large screens, in print and online, on stage and on hoardings, in comics and graphic novels, even on stamps and serial packets, Mary's progeny has certainly gone forth and prospered. But it all began when the 18-year-old Mary Godwin, as she then was, daughter of two of the most celebrated public intellectuals of the day, William Godwin and Mary Wollstonecraft, first came up with the idea in June 1816. Miranda Seymour, biographer of Mary Shelley and of Lord Byron's daughter, Ada Lovelace, has made a study of what sort of a person Mary Godwin was. Mary was an extraordinary young woman, unlike really anybody of her time, of her sex. She'd been brought up to follow the example of her mother who had died tragically just after giving birth to Mary. And because her mother was revered, Mary was put immediately into this position of being regarded as somebody extraordinary. And part of Mary's immense intelligence came from the fact that she was schooled as an only adored child. So great expectations to be worthy of both her father and her mother, Mary Wollstonecraft, the founding mother of women's liberation. So, here I am, either at the end of a world or the beginning of one. I think it can never have been far from her, this terrible feeling that she had in some sense, killed her mother. Um, Of course, what Mary Wollstonecraft died of was puerperal fever, but it would have seemed to the poor little girl that she was in some way responsible for her mother's death. Indeed, didn't she court the young Percy Shelley when she was 16, sitting on her mother's tomb in St Pancras Cemetery? She's alive! Alive! If you know one thing about Mary Shelley, it's probably that she wrote Frankenstein, a simple horror tale, the Buffy the Vampire Slayer of her day. But if you know one other thing, it's probably that she was married to Percy Shelley, who wrote complicated poems full of words like the and winged. So how could a big name in popular culture end up with the darling of the literary set? It'd be like if Salman Rushdie started going out with Graham Norton. (laughs) Following a whirlwind romance, Percy Shelley, who was married with two children, and Mary Godwin, eloped to the continent of Europe in May 1814, returned to England a few months later, frightened and in debt, and then ran away again in May 1816, this time to Geneva. Part of the attraction was that the infamous poet Lord Byron had already decided to travel there with his physician and companion Dr John Polidori. They all got together on the outskirts of Geneva. And there, ladies and gentlemen, on the other side of the lake, we have the famous villa Diodati, where Lord Byron, greatest living English poet, resides in exile. He was forced to leave his native land after many scandals. Mad, sad, and dangerous to know, she called him. 
it was uh, famously bad weather, the blood red summer, it just rained incessantly. So they're watching all these electric storms and it's pouring with rain. So they're all cooped up in the villa together. And that's part of the story too, isn't it? Well, the, the weather plays such an interesting role. Lightning jumps from peak to peak and they're, they're in the villa watching these terrifying storms. But interestingly, by the 16th and 17th June, which is when all the drama of the storytelling begins, the rain had set in and the weather has gone from what Mary described. I think she said, it, I've never seen such an enjoyable storm. She was obviously reveling in it all. And it's gone from that into just being very, very dreary. And I'm using the word dreary because it seems to me that when one reads these descriptions of them cooped up in the afternoon when it seemed like the middle of the night and they got the candles and the rain pattern gets shutters and you think of where Mary said her story began with it was a dreary night of November, I think it is quite likely that that's exactly how it did seem yes. to her then. It's a perfect night for mystery and horror. The air itself is filled with monsters. So on a dreary 17th of June, Byron, taking his cue from a trashy book he'd bought in the city, suggested they each tell a ghost story. The tensions within this group of highly strung individuals came to a head that night. When Mary Godwin told her story, the creation scene from Frankenstein, and when Byron seems to have begun his contribution as well, the first vampire story in English literature. It must have been one hell of a night later immortalised in the Hollywood movie The Bride of Frankenstein. Shelley, darling, will you please light these candles for me? <laughs> oh, Mary, darling. Astonishing creature. I Lord Byron. Frightened of thunder, fearful of the dark, and yet you have written a tale that sent my blood into icy creeps. <laughs> Look at her, Shelley. Can you believe that bland and lovely brow conceived of Frankenstein? At the time, Mary recalled that the idea for Frankenstein had first come to her in a nightmare. He sleeps, but he is awakened. Behold, the horrid thing stands at his bedside, looking on him with yellow, watery, but speculative eyes. The novelist Margaret Drabble evoked Mary Godwin's state of mind for the World Service programme Good Books. If you look at her life at that period of time, it isn't at all surprising that she was having nightmares. Um, she'd already given birth to one baby that died after a fortnight. She'd given birth to a second child who did survive. Um, Shelley had two little children. His first wife was about to commit suicide. And there was this monstrous anxiety on this young woman. And I feel that, in a way, one of the, the myths within Frankenstein that hasn't been much talked about because it's a woman's myth is the myth of giving birth and anxiety about one's own creative forces. We are the gods now. We have dared to call ourselves creators. And our punishment is that we have created. But created what? Out of this nightmare came Frankenstein, which began life as a short story, and then, in August 1816, Mary Godwin decided to expand this into a full-length novel, which she did over the next ten months in Geneva, Chamonix, Bath and Great Marlow. The earliest surviving manuscript is today kept in Oxford. We're now entering the Western Library, part of the Bodleian Library in Oxford, and opposite the ancient Bodleian Library, and this was opened in 2015 to house the archives and special collections and treasures and manuscripts. And we're coming through these rather modern doors and into this astonishing atrium, uh, modernist architecture, lots of books, and we're off to the manuscripts section. My name's Stephen Hebron, and I have the enviable job of looking after the Shelley manuscripts in the Bodleian Library. And we've got it in front of us the earliest version of Frankenstein that there is. Yes, what we have here are the now loose sheets of the notebook that Mary Shelley, we think, bought in Geneva in order to begin the first full draft of her novel. So this is what she calls chapter seventh, which is the great creation scene. What is happening? Meet my monster. This is the germ of the whole novel, which I think was always designed for, with a view to publication. In fact, there's one page of the manuscript where Shelley writes in the margin, this chapter is too short. 
So they're thinking of how it would look in a printed book. And although it seems odd for an 18-year-old girl to be thinking about publication, of course, given Mary Shelley's provenance, in that sense, it's not surprising that they were thinking, already looking over their shoulder at a, at a publication of this. Mary herself said, and I do not know whether her tongue was in her cheek or not, when she said that Percy was always inciting me to make the most of myself as a writer and to, you know, achieve what I should. And in fact, she was already, I think, a better writer than he was. The manuscripts reveal that Percy Shelley corrected Mary's punctuation, spelling and syntax, and that he did indeed rewrite some of her sinewy sentences in more poetic language. What sort of interventions does he make? Well, on this page that we're looking at, Mary writes, I had selected his features as... Handsome. Then we have handsome, 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 crossed out three times, and above one of the handsomes, Shelley has written beautiful. His limbs were in proportion, and I had selected his features as beautiful. Beautiful. Great God! Uh, there's a debate, isn't there, amongst scholars about the extent of his contribution to Frankenstein, because, I mean, you could argue he's correcting her grammar and syntax and punctuation a bit, yes. and occasionally making the language a little bit more flowery, but it's yes. a, a sort of editor partner relationship, in my view, anyway. I think when you look at the manuscript particularly, you can see it's nearly all in Mary Shelley's hand, mm, which, as you say, Shelley then takes and improves. Yes. Or, should we say, adapts. Adapts. Um, improves yes. is a moot point, because yes. she writes in this very direct, rather sort of muscular style, I think, mm. and he makes it much more flowery, and I'm not sure that's always to its advantage. Such an audience needs something stronger than a pretty little love story. So why shouldn't I write of monsters? Shelley thought of her as an intellectual equal, so they would have had conversations, they'd have shared their reading, they would have had, I think, quite intellectual discussions, cultural discussions with Byron as well. A couple of nights before the ghost story session, one of those intellectual conversations was about some current debates which were rocking the scientific community in London, to which Mary Godwin was, as she later put it, a devout but nearly silent listener. Debates about galvanism and the controversial experiments on a human cadaver by Giovanni Aldini, and about the nature of the principle of life. In her earliest draft, there was already a lot of backstory about Victor Frankenstein's university experiences. And over here we've got, next to the creation scene, we've got another This is a slightly chapter. earlier chapter. This is with Vic, the young Victor Frankenstein as a young scientist going off to the University of Ingolstadt yes. to study chemistry. Yes. I devoured the works of Cornelius Agrippa, Paracelsus and Albertus Magnus. The wild fancies of these long-dead alchemists, magicians and Kabbalists captured my adolescent heart. I reckon this is the first novel about the education of a young scientist that was ever written. And, yeah. and what's remarkable about it is, you know, Goethe had written The Sorrows of Young Werther, so there's lots of emotional biographies about the education of sensibilities uh, and so on. But no one had ever done, you know, what's it like to be an eager young research student, an eager young scientist learning chemistry. It's remarkable, really. Frankenstein has been called uh, the origin of science fiction. But how much do you think that Mary Godwin really knew about science? I think this is one of the things that I really would like to try to um, convey, is that I don't think it was a work of fiction in some ways. Professor Sharon Rustin of Lancaster University specialises in the literature and science of the Romantic period. One of the reviewers talked about it having an air of reality about it. And I think that those people in Geneva in 1816 thought that this really could happen, that it wasn't so far in the realm of fantasy, particularly with Giovanni Aldini's mm. experiments in 1802 and people trying to bring back murderers mm. and who'd been hanged. By attaching a voltaic battery to them and seeing what would happen. Yes, and, and, and some quite extreme reactions. You know, people go running from the room. They think that this murderer's coming back to life again. So we can't kind of imagine that now, perhaps. But if you try to resurrect the mind of an early 19th century person reading it, I think it might have been a real possibility. Alive! Don't you understand? We've given life to a creature, a creation, a jigsaw of all our worst fears in flesh and blood. 
One scientific controversy in particular was central to the Barr and Shelley Polidori conversation of June 15th, 1816, a controversy of earlier that year which involved the doctor surgeon who'd looked after both Percy and Mary, William Lawrence. There was a, a very public debate between two surgeons, John Abernethy and William Lawrence. And John Abernethy was a very conservative thinker and he very much believed that the principle of life was something super added to the inert body. So the body was just dead matter. There was no difference between a dead and living body. So there had to be something that was infused into this body, which he also likened to the soul. William Lawrence, who was portrayed as this kind of upstart, said this was outmoded and old-fashioned. And he said that really life was just the working operation of the body's parts. And then Abernathy said, you're saying that there is no soul, which Lawrence said, I'm not saying that at all, but no one really believed him. And Lawrence really did fail at that in that debate because he was made to withdraw his book. He lost his paid positions at the hospital. He had to recant his theory. Now, I am utterly utterly opposed to, to any forms of human violation. However, what I'm about to reveal is not human. Scientific themes were prominent and the science presented in surprisingly positive ways in the earliest draft and the fair copy of Frankenstein. Back to the Bodleian. We're now opening another set of folders, which is the, the next stage of... This is the fair copy um, from the draft where... Mary Shelley principally, but also Shelley writes it out in a much neater hand. Very, very few corrections. I think the corrections are really errors in transcription. And there would originally have been, we think, 11 or so notebooks full of this fair copy. And this is lovely. So all the expansion of it from that central story that we looked at earlier has taken place sort of post-Geneva. Yes. The second part of the novel is written in England. And I think rather than expanding it in length, they restructure it. So it's much more of a, a three-volume work. So by now she's 19, because she's 18 when she thinks of it, 19 when she develops it into a novel, and 20 when it's published. Exactly. Yeah. I sometimes meet people who are doing Frankenstein for A-level, and I say, you do realise that that was written when by someone who was your age, or at least started by someone Quite who was your age. Yes. Quite astonishing. They were all extraordinarily ahead of their time. It is amazing, isn't it? There's, there's free love, there's dope. Everything. There's uh, spooky stories. There's, uh, yes, it's... it's so um, you could plop yeah. them down in California with Jefferson <laughs> Airplane and imagine they'd be having a wonderful time. Well, exactly. <laughs> Infidels, wantons, or oh, what lively company. The first edition of Frankenstein, when it was published, wasn't a success. Most of the books about Mary Shelley claim that it was an instant bestseller. It wasn't. At the time when the book was published in 1818, it was only published in 500 copies. And by 1831, when Mary sold the copyright for, I think it was £30, which sounds not much, but it meant a lot to Mary. She was very, very poor by then. Her husband had died. She was bringing up her only surviving child on her own with great difficulty and with tremendous opposition from the Shelley family. And the only name she was allowed to use as a writer was the author of Frankenstein. Everything really points to the fact that she desperately needed Frankenstein to really sell. Because in an era when the concept of intellectual property had yet to be invented, it was the many unauthorised and stripped-down stage versions, rather than the novel itself, which launched the F-word into the culture. Just eight years after publication, at least 15 English and French versions or burlesques had opened. Behold, the horrid corpse to which I have given life! Presumption, I think, is one of the first play versions of it. Mary Shelley goes to see it and says, I'm famous. And all the things we associate with the movies are all in there by 1826. It becomes a different thing. The amazing thing about Mary Shelley is that, you know, today she'd be worried about not having any royalties. In those days, she was thrilled to bits that <laughs> yeah. someone had made a play out of it. She didn't make a penny. No. When Mary Shelley went on to publish in October 1831 her more popular abridged single-volume edition, 
partly to cash in on the success of the theatrical versions. She even incorporated some of the stage elements into her story. I think that she she was channeling all of that yes. and she plays up the idea of presumption, which is the word she suddenly introduces in this new edition. Yes. Uh, Victor becomes a sort of mad scientist like he was on the stage. It crudifies the story a bit. And the strange thing is that for most people reading Frankenstein, that's the edition that they mm. read. I think that by 1831, so much has changed in Mary Shelley's life. And I think she really tries to tone down the radicalism of the book. And that actually does mean taking out some of the science, particularly the radical science yes. in it. Einstein said, if I'd known where this would lead, I'd have been a watchmaker. She used, didn't she, to do reading lists in her journal. Mm. Unfortunately, the, the volume for her journal, which is the key one for me, which is June 1816, when she told the ghost story, is missing. But in the volume before and the volume afterwards, long list of things she's reading. Uh, in fact, I think some people have referred to Frankenstein as an example of bibliomania, in a sense, <laughs> that, that because she's only 18, she doesn't know how to hide her sources too well. Paradise Lost excited different and far deeper emotions. I read it as I had read the other volumes which had fallen into my hands as a true history. It moved every feeling of wonder and awe that the picture of an omnipotent god warring with his creatures was capable of exciting. The key work, really, is Paradise Lost. And all the way through the story of Frankenstein, you have this sense of, of Milton's language, tragically lost in the films where the monster, if he's very, it's sort of the creature originally, the <laughs> monster always in the films. But he's very lucky if he's allowed to say smoke yeah, that's right. or friend. Smoke, good. Drink, drink. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Good, good. I would just about argue that Boris Karloff's inarticulate monster in, in Frankenstein is as powerful, if not more so, than Mary Shelley's very chatty Milton quoting monster. The critic and novelist Kim Newman, connoisseur of horror movies who admits to being a Frankenstein completist. It used to be said that every generation had its Hamlet, you know, you, and, and so you'd go from Irving to Barrymore to Gilgood to Olivier. But of course now every generation needs its Frankenstein and its Dracula and its Sherlock Holmes, often the same actors. And what's different between these characters and, say, Macbeth or, or Othello is that there's no set text. Frankenstein as a novel is remarkable in all kinds of ways, but it is not immutable. Going right back to the beginning, 1910, Edison, the, the first story yeah. horror movie worthy of the name Frankenstein, which has quite recently come to light, having been a lost film, What's your take on that one? Several things about it are really annoying. One is that even for 1910, it's kind of primitive cinematically. And the other thing is, it's all a dream, mm. uh, which was the bane of horror films for the first 15, 20 years of their existence. But its creation sequence is almost the first creation sequence that, that uses special effects, mm. including running the film backwards. Which it did for the transformation of a skeleton into a hideous figure with bulbous eyes and frizzy hair in a huge bubbling pot. But one particular portrayal of the creature overshadows all others. When this dead hand moves, the monster created by a man they called Mad is turned loose to strike terror into the hearts of men. Boris Karloff, you were cut out for the foreign service. If your family had had their way, you'd have been in the consular service in China. But in 1931, you landed the part of the monster in the film Frankenstein. There are many conflicting reports about how you got this job. Can you tell us, in fact, how you did get the job? I was working in the film at Universal, and I was in the commissary for lunch. And James Whale, you know, the journey's in man, he was to direct first Frankenstein and he called me over to his table to have a cup of coffee with him after lunch and said he'd like to make a test of the monster and Frankenstein for me. I was delighted at the thought of another job but I must say my feelings were a little bit hurt 
because I had on my best suit and rather, uh, I thought, rather a saucy, straight makeup, and all he could think of was the monster. However, a job is a job. I'm Sarah Karloff, and my father was Boris Karloff, otherwise known as William Henry Pratt. Well, he was definitely grateful to the creature because it made such a pivotal difference in his life, both personally and professionally. Uh, Frankenstein was his 81st film, and as he often said in interviews, nobody had seen the first 80 films. In the opening credits, it's a question mark, not a name, opposite the creature. He wasn't even invited to the premiere because uh, it wasn't expected that the creature would be the star. This is the story you've heard about, talked about, the spine-tingling, blood-chilling story that stuns your emotions. Frankenstein. Don't touch that! Certainly in terms of how we think the Frankenstein monster looks, that one movie gifted pop culture, you know, a potent figure, partly through performance, partly through Jack Pierce's makeup work. Well, he always referred to Jack Pierce as an absolute genius. That makeup was done before the time of all the prosthetics that are used today, and the camera doesn't lie. If you look at the, the, the whining censorship complaints at the time, people kept saying things like, oh, this, this film should never be shown to children. My father said, children got it. They understood that the creature was the victim and not the perpetrator. I do think it a shame, Mary, to end your story quite so suddenly. That wasn't the end at all. Would you like to hear what happened after that? Four years after that first Frankenstein film, we had the Bride of Frankenstein, and a few years after that, the Son of Frankenstein. You'll observe it's all in extremely proper order. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Frankenstein creates a bride and has a son. And then, in 1948, he met Abbott and Costello, followed by youth on the loose drive-in versions of the 1950s, and then, inevitably, came the parodies, such as the hit record of 1962, The Monster Mash, by Karloff impersonator Bobby Pickett with the Crypt Kickers. This created a jerky dance craze and was, I'm afraid to say, banned by the BBC. I was working in the lab late one night when my eyes beheld an eerie sight for my monster from his slab began to rise and suddenly, to my surprise He did the mash He did the monster mash The monster mash It was a graveyard smash He did the mash It caught on in a flash He did the mash He did the monster mash all of that was a compliment, and he took it as such. He did some things on television that were um, pretty ridiculous. He got to the point that um, he could spoof his own boogeyman image. The Rosemary Clooney Show Our very, very special guest Boris Karloff. Hello there, boys and girls. Are you all ready for another story from your Uncle Boris? Good. Pull up your chairs nice and close to the television set. By the mid-1960s, the television series The Munsters could feature benign Fred Gwynn as cuddly father Herman in a loving parody of the old Hollywood movies which also sent up the all-American family. Gwynn's face was so ideally suited to Karloff-style makeup that colleagues would say to him as they saw him on the set, Working today, are you, Fred? Herman, what's wrong? I know. They fired you at the parlor. You've been lying down on the job again. No. The, the one time I did lie down, they mistook me for a customer. <laughs> I almost got carried away that time. There's an out kid by the name of Frankenstein. Having got into parody with the Munsters and onto television and become more and more cuddly, it finds its way into pop music as yeah. well in the 60s and 70s. That starts with outright parodies. And then it becomes slightly more serious because obviously I can see that there's a real attraction between, say, you know, the, the people who make prog rock and the vision of Frankenstein. Yeah. One of the odder productions is there was a Frankenstein's Wedding, which was broadcast live on BBC TV, but it was a, an event at Leeds Castle, which 
which was kind of like part rock concert, <laughs> part musical adaptation of Frankenstein. I'm sorry to ruin your big day. Who are you? I've spent every minute since your husband created me asking myself the same question. It's the first time I've seen outside of Blackenstein the casting of a black actor as the monster, David Harewood, who's like a really strong, distinguished presence surrounded by people who are not very good rock singers. <laughs> yeah. A film company, Hammer Films, was looking for a very tall, very big man. And I think they'd learned that I'd done a lot of mime and things like that in the theatre in the preceding ten years. And they wanted somebody who could play a part without speaking and uh, who was tall and who was big. So for the first time in my career as an actor, these two elements helped me rather than hindered me. Christopher Lee starred in Hammer's first Frankenstein movie, The Curse of Frankenstein, in 1957. The first version in gruesome colour, the first with a repressive Victorian setting, and the first where Baron Frankenstein enjoys being cruel. Directors Martin Scorsese and John Carpenter are huge fans. It seemed that when we saw Curse of Frankenstein, there was a graphic quality to it that was totally uncalled for. Which... <laughs> which made it extremely endearing to us. We enjoyed it a great deal. That was one of the first horror films that took a subject and brought in, for a time, of shocking violence, shocking gore. The Hammer films, they are maybe the first uh, sort of people to take on Frankenstein with the proviso they could do anything they want as long as it's not like the Universal films, which I think leads them simply to counter-program. They come up with a story that's focused on the Baron Frankenstein. Peter Cushing is very much the lead. I saw they were doing Frankenstein, a remake, after 25 years' absence from the screen. And I remember seeing the original with Colin Clive and Boris Karloff, and remember it was absolutely wonderful. So I knew there was a break coming in my television um, work, uh, and I said, but what about doing this? It would be a nice one to have a try at. His monsters, initially Christopher Lee, are all rather disposable. In Curse of Frankenstein, the monster is literally disposed of in acid and, mm. and, and reduced to nothing. It's a 1950s story made, obviously, under the, the shadow of the Manhattan Project. So there's a sort of sense that we were less likely to accept boffins of any sort as altruistic idealists or even romantic visionaries. Christopher Lee not only had to adapt his performance, but also how the creature looked. The makeup was quite horrendous, there's no other word for it, and it was very much hit and miss because we were not allowed to copy the universal makeup that Boris Karloff wore because of the um, question of copyright. So I really looked as somebody quite rightly said, like a road accident. This thing must be destroyed before it regains consciousness. Do you hear me, Victor? What, what, what did you say? You must destroy this thing now. Paul, don't you see? I've succeeded. You succeeded, yes, nearly succeeded in getting yourself killed. Jim Careers came to me one day and said, I sold another Frankenstein. I said, oh, well done. Jimmy Sangster was to write three of the Hammer series of seven Frankensteins. He said, and we were doing the return of Frankenstein. I said, I killed him in the first episode. He said, oh, you'll think of something. But I have escaped the guillotine, and I shall avenge the death of my creation. It came to a suitably bloody end with Frankenstein and the Monster from Hell, filmed in 1972, and released in 1974. Dave Prowse did a magnificent job in, the his, creature. in his The Creature, in his rubber suit. I just wish that Hammer had spent a little more money and it didn't look like Dave staring through, you know, the peepholes. Madeline Smith, the epitome of Hammer glamour, played Sarah, the mute daughter of the mm. asylum director, who is selected as the monster's mate. If everything could be reborn, unblemished, if a new version of his true self could be created, huh? In the normal way, by mating. But who with? Sarah. I do have an enormous criticism, which is there was far too much gore. 
and they were real eyeballs, stinking sheep's eyeballs. They were real, and 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 they did keep dropping on the floor, and we were sliding about on them, <laughs> going in after the weekend when they hadn't been in the fridge, and the smell was abhorrent. And in fact, it's all on a couple of sets at Elstree. To my mind, it was one set with various doors coming off it, but um, it took quite a lot of acting on my part, I have to tell you, because mm. it wasn't very terrifying. However, I think the end product is probably better than it should have been. Yeah. One thing that's unusual about Frankenstein is the circumstances of its creation have become almost as yeah. famous, if not more famous, than the novel itself. In the 80s, there was um, Gothic, the Ken Russell film, which Stephen Volk wrote, and Ivan Passer's Haunted Summer, another film called Rowing in the Wind. Spanish film. Mm. And Roger Corman's Frankenstein Unbound from the Brian Aldiss novel all include the Byron Shelley menage. For one summer, they were enriched in the danger of their own lives. Glimpse the demon behind the mask. Mary loves you. Mary loves you. There's the terrible danger in this, Shelley. In the film versions, I always think that Mary Shelley gets rather diminished, mm. that Byron becomes the main character. I mean, in the case of the Roger Corman, yeah. Frankenstein Unbound, as this terrible thing of a modern scientist played yeah. by John Hurt helps her to write it. Yes. No, because I she's was... rather stuck, yeah. as if Mary Shelley needed the help of a, yeah. of a chap to finish the book. Maybe there's a sense of male creatives rather hemming around her. But no. Byron, besides being a genius as a poet, was a genius at marketing himself. Yeah. Yeah. You have a sense of somebody who knew the worth of self-drama in the way I think Byron lived kind of the way Alice Cooper lived. You know, <laughs> that, that sense of embracing the mythology. I'm a teenage Frankenstein The local freak with a twisted mind I'm a teenage Frankenstein Amid all this, Mel Brooks managed to breathe new life into dead tissue with his affectionate monochrome comedy film, Young Frankenstein, released in 1974, complete with the original laboratory equipment of 1931, which had been rediscovered in a store. Throw the third switch! Not the third switch! Throw it, I say! Throw it! Since the climax involved Dr. Frederick Frankenstein, Gene Wilder, performing with his creature, the Fred Astaire number, putting on the Ritz in white tie and tails, it was predictable that young Frankenstein would eventually turn into a stage musical, which it did in 2007, and then in a revised version for the London stage, autumn 2017. That's Frankenstein. My name. It's pronounced Frankenstein. You must be Igor. No, it's pronounced Igor. I'm in the foyer of the Garrick Theatre in London, waiting for the crowds to come out of a matinee of Young Frankenstein. What was your favourite bit in the show? Yeah. I loved um, Igor. I thought he was really yeah, funny. Yeah, really he was good. really funny throughout. Yeah. Have you ever read the original book? Do you no, know I haven't. About no. It? Do you know anything about we it? We obviously have heard of it because it's such a famous character. I've seen the film. Oh, you've seen the and film? And I've read the book. Have yes, oh, yeah. Mary Shelley, but that was a long, long time ago. Yeah. And what do you reckon the story of Frankenstein's about? Oh, rebirth. And if I, if I mention the name Frankenstein, what does it conjure up in your mind? The monster, Frankenstein, yeah. Well, it, it's the monster, even though, of course, the monster isn't Frankenstein. That's right, everyone confuses everyone it. Everyone confuses it. Yeah, but if I say the word Frankenstein, what does that oh, conjure yeah, up in your mind? Horror. Definitely horror. horror. Yes. And monsters. Yes, definitely. Oh, you know, like, you know, the old films and all that. Um, bizarrely, putting on the Ritz. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, from what was once an inarticulate mass of lifeless tissues, may I now present a cultured, sophisticated, man about town. If you're blue and you don't know where to go to, why don't you go where fashion sits? <laughs> Different types who wear a day coat, pants with stripes or cut away coat, perfect fits. It was the only time Gene and I actually had a fight. He said, I think the monster should really show, uh, the doctor should show reanimation in its ultimate 
degree. The monster should sing and dance. And I said, no, 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 that'll tear it. It's, it's, it's Mary Shelley. It's James Whale. It's Universal. It's 1931. And Gene said, okay, make a deal with you. Get a little extra money. Shoot, putting on the Ritz. And we'll just, if it doesn't work, We'll just cut it out of the film. So we showed a rough cut at 20th Century Fox at the Little Theater. And at the end of it, I came to Gene in tears. I said, it's the best thing in the show. Please, I beg you, for safety's sake, don't humiliate him. By the time of the Rocky Horror Show in the yeah. 70s, in a way, it had all become nostalgia, how much we used to love those Universal yes. films, so we want yeah. to re-evoke them. Yeah, that probably something that dates back at least as far as the late 1950s when those films started appearing on television and when Famous Monsters of Film magazine was published and the first books about horror cinema. For John Landis, who made An American Werewolf in London and who's written about the Universal Studios monsters, it was reruns on American television that did it. There were the three major networks, and then there were local stations. Part of their programming was something they called Million Dollar Movie. So, for instance, Joe Dante saw them in New Jersey. I saw them in Los Angeles. Marty Scorsese saw them in New York. And Universal Studios packaged their classic horror films, Frankenstein, Bride of Frankenstein, Son of Frankenstein, Ghost, you know, House of Frankenstein, Ghost of Frankenstein. And most of the local stations had a horror host who often was the weatherman, but they were all very over-the-top silly. And they used to, you know, have spaghetti and meatballs and go brains, brains, and, you know, dry ice and stuff. And what Million Dollar Movie did was it would show a movie five nights a week at 8 o'clock, then on Saturday and Sunday. So you could literally, and we did, memorize movies. We are friends, you and I. Friends. <laughs> Well, <laughs> good, good. Andy Warhol, Frankenstein, is here. Kiss him. Kiss him. Newsweek magazine calls it the first original Frankenstein in years. A perversely fascinating movie. I think maybe the uh, Flesh for Frankenstein, the Andy Warhol production from mm -hmm. the 70s, sort of revived some of the transgressive notions of mm -hmm. Frankenstein. And actually, Frank N. Furter from the Rocky Horror Show is one of the most unpleasant mad scientists ever <laughs> in terms of a man who, who creates a monster purely to sexually molest it. He's kind of like genuinely appalling mm -hmm. in a way that most Frankensteins aren't. So, uh, come up to the lab and see what's on the slab. I see you shiver with anticipation. I see him as a cross between Cruella de Vil and Eisenstein's Ivan the Terrible Part 2. It's um, an evil that we kind of find attractive. Richard O'Brien, who wrote The Rocky Horror Show and who played the seedy butler Riff Raff. I loved rock and roll, I loved comics, I loved all those things that we were told weren't good for us. The B-movies and, and the dreadful sci-fi movies of, of, the, of the 50s. And I just thought the unintended humour in the writings was fantastic. <laughs> By the mid-1990s, Frankenstein had found its way into prestige mainstream cinema with Kenneth Branagh's elaborate $45 million costume drama, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. The problem was that cinema had left Mary Shelley behind long, long ago, and so critics and audiences were confused. What do you think of the Kenneth Branagh one, where they tried, they made a genuine attempt to adapt the whole book. Weirdly, the thing that lets it down for me is Robert De Niro. Mm. You cast one of the best film actors, yeah, a man who put on weight to play Raging Bull. <laughs> what 
could he do to play the Frankenstein monster, have his head stitched back on? Mm. Yeah, I don't think De Niro is as good as Christopher Lee, let alone Boris Karloff. In a film that requires the best Frankenstein monster you've ever seen to yeah. work. Did you ever consider the consequences of your actions? You gave me life, and then you left me to die. The gothic intensity of the novel was what we were trying to uh, present. And also, we were trying to get away from bolts in neck and to bring in a different kind of human dimension. Kenneth Branagh spoke to Mark Kermode in 2007 about his adaptation. People took the hump, frankly, because they thought I was, you know, showing off. Oh, he's trying to, oh, he's got a bit of a six pack, and here he is, he's got his. He did look good. Again. Thank you very much. But my point was really that, uh, I'm, in a way, you know, it's a regrettable that that perhaps gets in the way of seeing it, because what you see is a sort of hubristic act in which I appear to be just saying how bloody clever I am or something. It seemed to be what some of the reaction was, instead of just looking at the work itself. Kim Newman prefers some of the more obscure takes on the character. I kind of like Frankenstein conquers the world, the Japanese giant monster Frankenstein, and Frankenstein meets the space monster, all this. It's part of me that I really love, I was a teenage Frankenstein. It's, it's a perfect title. When the stitches are out, he'll pass for a normal, quite attractive teenager. Come, come, my boy, say good morning to your creator. Speak, you've got a civil tongue in your head, I know you have, because I sold it back myself. And there are a lot of teenagers in the audience at London's National Theatre in 2011 to see Benedict Cumberbatch alternate the part of the creature and Victor Frankenstein with Johnny Lee Miller in a new adaptation. I can create people. We saw together the version directed yes. by Danny Boyle. He did something that I don't think I'd seen in a Frankenstein adaptation before, but I've seen several times since, of starting with the creation. Therefore, it's not a, a story bracketed by several different narrators. Mm. It's a story from the viewpoint of the monster. You make sport with my life in the cause of science. This is your universe, Frankenstein! I spoke to the play's author, Nick Deere, on stage at the National Theatre while the production was on. Well, I'd never seen a stage version. There haven't been that many in, in my adult lifetime, that's for sure. I'd certainly seen the films, the famous films, and what struck me when I read the book again was that there was a great central uh, dynamic in the middle of the book, which was the creature's story which was never told in the films. In most of the films, the creature doesn't have a voice. He gets to grunt a bit and do bad things. And, and I thought it was sort of a missed opportunity in the movies that uh, I'd never seen what I thought was Mary Shelley's Frankenstein properly done. It's a while since we've had a genuinely disturbing Frankenstein. Mm. And I think it's not until you get the say, David Cronenberg's films in the 70s, which are mad science-type movies, mm. obviously informed by Frankenstein. Mm. Because Frankenstein is a really marvellous metaphor for our relationship with science in so many ways. Maximum input. Begin implosion sequence. But in this age of sort of corporate science, yeah. where even... It's say yeah. in the fly, where yeah. the scientist says, well, you know, I belong to the corporation, my yeah. results will belong to the corporation, yeah. or Jurassic Park, yeah. where the corporate man is, is stage managing the scientist. Do you think it's possible for the lone scientist still to work? Most recent Frankensteins have, ha have at least paid lip service to who's funding Frankenstein, mm. you know, where, where does his grant come from? Mm. What we're worried about is who's paying for Frankenstein. Good question. At a time when big biology is often in the headlines... IVF treatments, the genome project, animal-human transplants. The Frankenstein word has never seemed more timely and relevant. Chemistry and physics may make us anxious, 
But biology makes us really anxious, because in the end, it's about our humanity. John Landis has a theory about how the movies have played to this sense of unease. Most of the films that are made that are called science fiction movies, whether they're Frankenstein or The Fly, I find them all completely reactionary and anti-science. You know, there, there's even dialogue where people say there are some things man is not meant to know. That's the blaspheming. That's what Dr. Frankenstein does. His great crime is he questions. This is sacred stuff. He has the nerve, he has the gall to do God's work. In the name of God, now I know what it feels like to be God. And so Frankenstein, through countless adaptations and spin-offs, has become a ready-made expression of anxieties, especially about science and overreaching. It long ago left the world of literature altogether and became a popular myth, as these clips from the World Service's masterpiece in 2003 reveal. It's not possible in Britain cloning for fertility purposes, but they've given their blessing to cloning for stem cell research, which the government has also supported. And of course, people are always quick to criticise something which seems like Frankenstein to them. If it's going to be done at all, it needs refining to prove it's efficient and safe. The memorable phrase, Frankenstein food, served to capture the uncertainties in the minds of many people about whether genetic modification is safe and whether the bodies that carry out safety assessments can be trusted. So this is a sort of Frankenstein fear of, of actually creating something that you can't then control. Well, I, I would prefer not to talk about Frankenstein because I think that raises kind of mythological fears and worries. I believe we have now reached a moral and ethical watershed beyond which we venture into realms that belong to God and to God alone. Apart from certain medical applications, what actual right do we have to experiment Frankenstein-like with the very stuff of life? Why do you think it survived for 200 years as a on-the-shelf metaphor for our anxieties about science? I think it is that thing about not totally explaining to us how it happened so that you've got this um, ability to fill it in with your own anxieties. And I think also, while it is about science, it's about the ethics of science. Now, people have been openly critical about my approach, but I would like to assure you that the ethical and moral aspects of my work are paramount. I think that the plays and then the films and then the stuff about genetic science and even the suggestion that the first IVF baby was a Frankenstein creation, all that kind of talk has led us away from a book which had a far purer intention. And my view is that Mary really wanted it to be about parenting or nurture, if one wants a more modern word for it. I'm not sure whether she is criticising Victor Frankenstein for the creation of the creature. I think she's criticising him for then abandoning him and not guiding him in the way that a parent should. You, my creator, detest and spurn me, thy creature. You want to kill me? You who made me? The moment Frankenstein makes a monster isn't when he pulls the switch. It's when he kicks him out of the, of the laboratory because he's too hideous. Mm. That blow is the thing that warps the creature from divine perfect innocence into murdering misshapen fiend. Yeah. Many times I considered Satan as the fitter emblem of my condition. For often, like him, when I viewed the bliss of my protectors, the bitter gall of envy rose within me. So we've got a debate between the scientific and the biographical in commentaries about Frankenstein. Marina Warner, in her 1994 Wreath Lectures, bridged the public and the personal interpretations of Frankenstein by focusing on the themes of responsibility and selfishness. Frankenstein has become the contemporary parable of perverted science. But this reading overlooks the author's much more urgent message. Mary Shelley grasped the likelihood that a man might make a monster in his own image and then prove incapable of taking responsibility for him. Implicitly, she's recasting the monster in the image of its creator. 
The creature issues from Frankenstein as his brainchild, who is also his double, who acts to define him. Her extraordinary and brilliant book inaugurates a new breed of monster, who isn't ultimately alien, but my brother, myself. Even though the film and the book don't resemble each other, each has controversy, a man playing God, whether the creature is the victim or the perpetrator. It, it, it tweaks science, it tweaks religion, and it poses almost unanswerable questions, but always creates a conversation. Which goes to show that after its first 200 years, Frankenstein lives. It's alive. Life! Life, do you hear me? Give my creation life! Maybe the novel is more talked about than read these days, but still, it lives. And it continues to do its job as myth. Mary Shelley has proved to be every bit as influential as her father, William Godwin, her mother, Mary Wollstonecraft, and her husband, Percy Shelley, if not more so, which would have surprised her mightily. She lives! Because with Frankenstein, she provided us with a creation myth which works for today, and which was taken over in the popular imagination from Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. What would have happened, I wonder, if the weather had been sunny and dry in June 1816, and Byron, and Shelley and Mary Godwin had all spent their time sailing on the lake and rambling in the Alps. There would have been a monster gap in the culture. Go back to your rooms now. There's nothing more for you to see. It's all over. Now quietly, don't rush. 